Institute seminar, the series, I should have counted, but I didn't. Um, we are delighted to have Shirley Lee. So Shirley was an undergrad and then did her PhD at Ohio State University with John Beacon, um, before moving on to Slack. So she has worked in sort of all sorts of areas of astroparticle physics, and notably uh, the neutrino connection. So we're very happy to have her here, uh, where she'll talk about new opportunities in neutrino astrophysics. Thank you. Um, so today I will be talking about MEV astrophysical neutrinos, and um, including solar neutrinos and supernova neutrinos. So in my introduction, I will focus on comparing the, what's the current status of these two subfields and drawing the contrast between them. And then I'll highlight what I consider a fantastic new opportunity uh, for this field in terms of an upcoming online detector. And then what's kind of uh, R&D effort needed to uh, seize the opportunity. Okay, so we are trying to detect every single type of cosmic messenger coming on the sky. So, and every type of messenger has something unique to tell us, whether it's photons or to high energy gamma rays or gravitational waves or cosmic rays. And MEV astrophysical neutrinos um, are no exception. So, be, uh, they can directly tell us something about the, uh, what's going on inside the source, which either is either the center of the sun or core cap supernovae. And because of extremely high density of these sources, we can learn something from these neutrinos about how neutrinos mix in extreme environments um, and their particle properties, like how they interact with other particles, etc. And in addition, just something cute that some of the experimental techniques we've developed for MEV uh, astrophysical neutrinos turned out to have interesting applications in other, uh, in other measurements. For example, the cosmogenic background rejection technique that we developed for solar neutrinos turned out to have, poten have the potential to distinguish the flavors of high energy astrophysical neutrinos. So neutrinos we detect in ice cube, which is just a cute point. So to sum up, ast MEV astrophysical neutrinos are awesome. And and certainly, everyone knows that, so we've been trying to study them for decades. So next, I just want to give a summary of what I think or where we are uh, studying them. So the first one, let's look at solar neutrinos. So I think it's always informative to just look at the data. Uh, so this is uh, one illustration of the current super, uh, solar neutrino data. So in super K, because there's a lot of electrons, neutrinos are measured by electro, neutrino electron scattering. That's interaction on top, where you measure outgoing electron. So this is one typical way they're showing the data. So because you always know where the sun is, so you can measure, you can histogram your events based on their angle, uh, the angle of the event away from the sun. And the solar neutrino, because they're mostly, if that's the sun, they're mostly pointing backwards. So the data peaks here, like at one. And that, of course, because it's MEV neutrino detection, there is always a lot of background. So that's this sort of flat line is kind of the background. So it's, this is background, and that's the data. And with this, this is the retina here. So basically, the point is, just by brief look, there's a lot of events. And just to better quantify it, we have about 10 solar neutrino events per day in SuperK. And SuperK has been running for about 20 years. So this is, is huge. And you can tell from here that the data is pretty, actually, I would say extremely high quality. OK, so that's just a snapshot. And of course, from this amount of good data, we've actually learned a whole lot of, uh, from solar neutrinos. So the left figure, so both figures show our basic theory, in some way, our theory on a prediction of what we know about solar neutrinos. So the left figure shows the predicted flux. So solar, neutri uh, solar neutri neutrinos are produced uh, in the sun from nuclear fusion reactions. And there's just uh, each line is the flux of that particular neutrino from a particular uh, reaction. So roughly speaking, solar neutrino is something that has energy from 0 to about 20 MeV. And so each uh, flux is shown here with the error that's the theory prediction, uh, error of the theory prediction. 
and that's the astrophysics part. And on the neutrino mixing part, solar neutrino oscillation is often parameterized shown this way, where the y-axis is the so-called survivor probability. So it's a probability of neutrino produced as nu e, which is all the time, and it's still detected as nu e as a function of neutrino energy. And so, after 30 years of measuring solar neutrinos, or 20, um, we've basically confirmed the picture. We've measured solar neutrinos from a whole bunch of these different branches, and the prediction and the data match. And also, we measure the survival probably at different uh, energies. Those are mostly from corresponding to different branches. And you can see that the data and the theory also predict, uh, also agree quite well. But if we want to be very precise, there are quite a few extremely well, I would say, well-defined open questions in solar neutrinos. For example, we've measured a bunch of these branches, but these, what I label, these are called CNO neutrinos. That's the green dash line. And this one is called HAP neutrinos from helium and proton interaction. So there are four chains that have not been detected. And on the mixing side, although in the previous figure, it kind of shown that our measurement of the mixing, uh, mixing probability and the prediction kind of agree, they actually don't quite agree as well. So in solar sector, we measure these two mixing parameters, theta 1, 2, and uh, delta m 2, 1. And the global, data set, the global solar data set gives you the best fit of the black point and 1, 2, 3 uh, sigma contour. So that's the color. In a completely different setting, in reactor neutrinos on Earth, we can measure the same two parameters. So that is the reactor Kamlet contour of one, two, three sigma. So you can see that uh, they kind of disagree at two sigma-ish level, um, which is of course not, you know, it's not a five sigma discrepancy, but it's still kind of interesting to think about why is there two sigma di uh, difference between solar data set and reactor data set. So I would say these are what I considered obvious questions one needs to answer for solar neutrinos. And of course, how would we go about answering them? I think it's rather straightforward in this case. We just need better, more precise data of measuring solar neutrinos. OK, so this is one of the MEV uh, astrophysical neutrinos. The other one, of course, is supernova. And just like the solar case, I think it's very informative to always show the data. So these are all the supernova neutrinos we've detected from supernova 87A. And so, and this explosion, okay, so at that time we only have one detection channel um, because we have detectors that's filled with water that has proton. And it, you can detect new E bar from this inverse beta decay where you measure this outgoing positron. So here it, it, the show is the energy of the positron and the time from the initial burst. So you see that we've got a total of 20 or so data points that last about 10, uh, 12 seconds, and that's all. And so what did we learn from these data? Well, actually, we learned quite a bit in that they confirmed our basic understanding of what we expect of supernova neutrinos. So for supernova neutrino source signal, what roughly do we expect? We know that almost all the gravitational binding energy of the supernova comes up, of the collapsed core come out as MEV neutrinos. And we know roughly that supernova neutrinos should come out equally in six flavors. So nu e, nu e bar, nu mu, nu mu bar, nu tau, nu tau bar. Roughly, it's just one over, six, one over six. So we can add up the total energy in all the nu e bar, multiply by six, and it roughly corresponds to the total energy we expect. That's great. In addition, we also know that the supernova neutrino spectrum, it's not quite thermal, but it's something like not that different from thermal. So it's like a peak thing. That roughly go between you know, 10 to 60, 50 MeV. And that's also basically consistent with what we saw. And the signal lasts about 10 seconds or so, and that's also roughly consistent with what we expect of the supernova explosion duration. <coughs> so it just generally confirmed reasonable broad picture which is good, but it's not good enough to, if we want to actually learn more details about the model. For example, um, right, there, 
going into numerical model, there are different parameters we can try to constrain. What's the equation of state? What's some particular cross-section rate? And this data set is just not good enough to do that. And that's obviously not surprising. It's, you know, 20 events. So given this, what are the open questions that we can hope to answer with supernova neutrinos? And I would say there's many. And this is the incomplete list. list. So the top one I would say is that we generally expect neutrino heating is the correct mechanism to explode supernova. But that is not a agreed upon question. That there's, we roughly expect that, but we don't know that for sure. And this is something that we very much like to confirm with neutrinos, with quark-ops neutrinos. And in addition, because the density of the supernova is so high, not just the matter density, but the neutrino density inside supernova itself so high, Oscill supernova oscillation is a whole new game. It has, it, it's so complicated. It has almost no resem re resemblance of how we normally compute neutrino oscillation in like terrestrial em environment. So how do neutrinos oscillate in supernova? I would say that's a completely unsolved question. And also we know that supernova environment explosion is where a lot of heavy elements are produced. Um, and we roughly know what they are, but we don't really know how much of each. Like for one particular heavy element, how much fraction is produced in the supernova environment, we don't know that. And obviously that's important for, for example, stellar evolution. And lastly, I would say also a very basic question, we don't know what remnants form of a supernova. Meaning that after a core collapse, you either get a neutron star or you either get a black hole, and, and you want to know which one it is. But we don't really know, for example, if I explode a 15 solar mass uh, supernova, does it form a neutron star like 60% of time and 40% of time it forms a black hole, or which one it is? So for example, for 87A, after 30 years of intense observational effort, we're still not sure whether that thing leads to a neutron star or a black hole. In fact, if you follow news, I think about a month ago, there, um, there's an observational team that seemed to say that they observed a neutron star, but actually not 100% not sure. So these are just some say, very big, important questions we want to answer. And of course, just to draw the contrast with solar neutrinos, not only that there are a lot of questions we don't know, but that there's also a lot of unknown unknowns in that we can totally expect something very surprising out of a supernova neutrino signal. And we, because there's just so many open questions, whereas we don't really expect that in solar neutrino sector. Okay, so with this many important questions open, how are we gonna address them? I would say here, more theoretical effort is definitely needed. Um, for example, theorists can possibly figure out how would neutrino oscillate in supernova. But all of them are extremely complex questions. Even if someday we have what we think are very good theoretical answers, it is still crucial to test them with data. So I would say, despite a different status, the answer to both problems or to both fields are the same, that we need better data. Okay, and how are we going to get qualitatively better or more data? There's quite a few different opportunities, and I will focus on one in my, the rest of my talk. And um, that is DOOM, far detector. So DOOM is a proposed, uh, is a under construction stage, I would say long baseline, long baseline neutrino oscillation uh, program in the US. And uh, its main science goal is to measure uh, CP violation and mass hierarchy from beam, accelerator beam neutrinos. And its far detector is what I'll focus on. It's a 40 kiloton liquid argon detector on deep underground. Now, I'm a theorist, so what that means to me is this is the far detector. The most precious thing is argon-40, and argon-40 is just amazing. So, when I was young, like I, I, I know a lot of people who are like super into one particular isotope, and I always thought they're like a little weird, but like, <laughs> argon-40 is, so great for so many reasons. Now, here's why. And it, it, I just want to really emphasize that you cannot find another isotope that will have the following properties. Really, <laughs> never. So. so the thing that's great about argon-40 is this interaction channel. Mu E plus argon-40 goes to electron and potassium. Where, um, so this happens at about, like, say, 20 MeV. 
And then you have this electron that's you know, 15 MeV or something that you can observe in your detector. And you go to a, possibly a, a few different excited states of the potassium. So potassium could decay just going back down to ground state of potassium. That might give you some gamma ray, but we can talk about that later. But what you, roughly what you see is this electron. Now, why is this channel so great? Um, so for a few different reasons. So first, don't try to read the plot yet. Um, it's just a, a, a very nice summary figure um, of all the possible interaction channels for MeV neutrinos, so all of them. And I just want to focus on uh, these two. So this is argon-40 cross-section. This is neutrino electron scattering. Because without argon-40, let's say neutrino electron scattering is the only channel that exists uh, for new E detection that was very, very large detector mass. Right, so that's what supergate has, because every detector has electron, so this channel is always present. And you see that this, this cross-section is super nice, because first, it, the cross-section is just much, much higher. Um, and for neutrino detection, you always appreciate higher cross -section, larger cross-section, because that means higher event rate. But that is only one of the uh, advantage of this channel. The other thing is, okay, so the other thing is, generally, if you want larger cross-section, what you want is neutrino interact with some sort of nucleus. For example, if you put a proton here or you put a lead here, the cross-section tend to be, you know, these sort, of, these sort of lines as opposed to down here. So what about the other nuclei? nuclei? Well, they're less good for one crucial problem. Typically speaking, this interaction has a very high, has a high-ish threshold. Meaning that, uh, for example, randomly pick this line, which is not a great example because it's neutral carbon. But the idea is the same, it's just on carbon-12. So if you look at this cross-section, yes, overall it's high-ish, um, but it has a very high threshold. So the cross-section only kicks in when neutrino energy is above like 16 or so MeV. And this is pretty common because you see a bunch of vertical lines here. So those are different cross uh, thresholds. And they're all about 10 MeV. So what this means is, okay, if your neutrino is below 10 MeV, you don't see them. Even for neutrino, so that's part of your spectrum. But even for a, a neutrino energy above 10 MeV, if the threshold is 10, this electron energy is at least 10 MeV lighter than neutrino. And if you're familiar with MeV neutrino detection, higher electron energy is always appreciated because everything just gets much harder at lower energy. What's the super nice thing about this channel is it has almost no uh, threshold. So the threshold is actually, the ground to ground state potassium is actually only 1.5 MeV. There's, it just does not get any lower than that. So it's really fantastic. And the last thing is, again, compared to uh, neutrino electron scattering, is that, okay, so you always measure the electron and you want to infer the neutrino energy. Of course, there's a lot of you know, procedure that goes into this reconstruction to back to neutrino energy. But roughly speaking, if it's kinematic like this, because the, um, because the nuclei is so much heavier than the neutrino, basically the energy between the neutrino and the electron is one to one, roughly. Meaning that if you know the threshold of this interaction, um, the electron energy is always neutrino energy minus that thresholds. Because you go to different excited states, so there's additional number. But it's basically 5 MeV, 10 MeV, you know, 10 MeV, 15 MeV, which makes reconstruction really, really simple. And this is maximally not true for neutrino electron scattering, which causes problems. And I will explain that in detail later. So what is the highest uh, land there? Is that the <coughs> Great question. So I believe this line is coherent neutral card with uh, proton. So coherent, of course, because of the A squared enhancement is always the highest cross section, um, which, which generally, uh, to me, like it works on a slightly different scale because the thing about coherent is that you have um, you measure the you measure the quenched signal. So the the signal is much much lighter than like for example five MeV. So if your detector is a 5 MeV and above detector, the coherent is unfortunately not really a good signal channel because of the visible energy is too small. So all the, all, yeah, all the rest, you basically get a 5 MeV or 10 MeV signal on the electron. 
and, but the cross section there is highest. So the neutrino uh, argon threshold, though, is the ground state transition is forbidden, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, yes, uh, the the most the the super allowed state has a four four point four MeV excited state. So it's like a five MeV threshold, right. exactly. But even that, it's still much lower than like everything else sure. because it's generally like above ten. Yeah. Yes, and I'll mention that later. Um, okay. So, okay, so now let's see what exactly can we do with this the best argon 40 that you can get. So first, let's look at the solar neutrino channel. Um, just to understand how this contributes to our current, under, uh, to our cur current uh, measurement, so I'll briefly explain how, what's, how solar, what's the key, I think, our solar neutrino detection. And I feel a bit nervous giving this in front of Mark, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so again, this is the, just the survival probability. Uh, again, it's a function of neutrino energy. And so this is probably, I would say, the most common type of plot you will see when it comes to solar oscillation, where the data is overlaid. But I really don't quite uh, like it in some sense, um, because it does not show a crucial effect that actually contributes super importantly into the global, uh, global fit which is this thing. So uh, let's go back. So let's, let's roughly, so here, um, the, os the oscillation probably is basically flat, lower, and flat, higher, with a, with a transition region. So what happens in the transition is that the oscillation is turning from matter-dominant regime to vacuum-dominant regime, meaning when your channel energy is high, you're basically, you actually see the electrons in the solar core. So, uh, and the presence of the electrons change how neutrino oscillate. And when neutrino energy is very low, you essentially don't, it, it's just as if neutrinos are propagating in vacuum. And it works out such that you, most, of the, most of the energy spectrum is in two extreme regime. And the middle is where you're kind of half seeing the matter potential and half not. So there's this energy dependence. And that's kind of like a famous, and it's, this is called upturn. Now, the reason I think it's, a, it's not so, at least comprehensive, is that yes, there's this up term, but there's another matter-induced effect that is really crucial, and that's the so-called day-night effect. Um, meaning that for solar neutrino to reach us at, during the daytime, needs to propagate outside, this, go, go through the sun, sure, um, but it doesn't need to go through much of Earth. But when neutrinos reach us at nighttime, it needs to go through the sun, okay? But it also needs to trans, uh, transverse pretty much the entire Earth. And even though there's not as much Earth matter in Earth compared to the sun, you can sense it somehow. So you see the probability between night and day differ by a little bit. This is a small percentage, but it still differs. So this difference is the, uh, the so-called day-night effect. And this difference is really what's dominating the fact of the sensitivity of the delta M square. So the fact that the global fit of the delta M square is low compared to Kamland is because we are observing too much of day-night effect compared to what we expect if we believe these oscillation uh, parameters. Um, and right, so that's why the solar here, I said it's dominated by matter effect, but not in the sun, but by going through Earth. Whereas reactor experiments, because, because of the setup, it really leads like a vacuum oscillation. So this is like first year quantum mechanics of oscillating, like two level oscillating systems. Um, so this reactor measurement is measuring, I would say, the oscillation parameters in the absolute vacuum sense. Whereas the solar is more like measuring neutrino matter interaction. Okay, so what, so that's the theory behind it. So what's measurement are contributing, uh, dominating the sensitivity of the solar region? I would say there's two major contributors. The first one is, of course, snow. And um, I'll go brief, because I just assume everyone knows this. Um, so snow, <laughs> snow famously detects solar neutrinos with three channels. And, and it maps onto, it super nicely maps onto this figure. So I'll explain what it is. So solar neutrino is 100% UE. And it oscillates to something else. You want to measure how much new year is and how much something else there is. 
So the first channel is this one. Um, it's the charge current channel where you are only sensitive to new E. So whatever that value you measure, it puts a vertical line. So this is new E flux, this is new mu and tau flux. Um, so you put a vertical line in new E. So you measure this, and you know nothing about mu and tau from this channel. And then you also have this neutral current channel where you're equally sensitive to new E, new mu, new tau. So what you're measuring is the sum of E plus mu and plus tau. So this measurement, put a, it's just diagonal line here. You're measuring the sum. And in addition, they also have this uh, neutrino electron uh, scattering channel where it, it has mostly sensitive to mu E, but a little bit mu and tau as well. So you're measuring some sort of a linear combination of the x and y flux fluxes. That's why it's like this tilted line. And the three measurements combined really pin down, intersect at one point. And you know exactly what's the total, how much it has oscillated in UE, and how much it remains in UE, and how much it oscillates in mu and tau. And the whole picture confirmed uh, confirm with our uh, theory prediction of what's the total flux. So this is one of the dominant uh, contributors to the global solar fit. Another important experiment is SuperK. And um, as I said, SuperK measures, unfortunately, SuperK for new E, SuperK has only this channel that neutrino interact with the electron where you measure outgoing electron. So having this channel alone in one detector has two, I would say, disadvantage. The first is that because you're measuring a survival probability, you want to measure really two kind of fluxes, and you can take the ratio so you know how much E, mu, and tau there is. But because this channel is mostly sensitive to new E, and it has a one thick mix of mu and tau, so you're only measuring one linear combination. So you need someone else to tell you either what's the total, or what's new E only, or what's mu and tau only, to know what is the ratio. So where is the, in the survival probability, where is the line on the vertical scale? So roughly speaking, you can imagine, that you can understand it as that the, and I forgot to say that the vertical scale of the survival probability determines the angle. So roughly speaking, super key measurement of the angle is limited by the fact that we don't, it doesn't have a neutral current channel. So it still uses Snow's neutral current channel of the total flux, and that's limiting the improvement of uh, the angle. And in addition, uh, this is really just something I talked about earlier in that, so the survival probably changes as a function of energy. So you really want to know what's the rate at a fixed neutrino energy, at a different neutrino energy, and et cetera. But you don't measure neutrino energy, you measure electron energy. So you want something that connects electron back to neutrino energy very well. And this is maximally <coughs> not the case. So this is differential cross-section of neutrino electron scattering. And the way to read the plot is that basically if you have a neutrino at 10 MeV, like this line, the outgoing electron is pretty much equally likely to be anywhere between 0 to 10. So if you measure electron of 10 MeV, then the neutrino energy is really anywhere, uh, any, anywhere above 10. So what this means is even, if you're de even though your detector may have really good resolution on the electron, when you unfold it back to the neutrino energy, it got really wide smearing. And that's just the kinematics of this interaction, which makes the delta m square measurement really, really difficult because you want to know how things change as a function of energy. Okay, so this brings us to June, uh, where, as I said before, that the really unique channel is this charge current interaction. So now let's see how Dune measurement differ from that of super -K. So again, this is the snow side plot where the the great the dashed great bands are the snow contours. So that's the snow charge current and snow neutral current. And this is to make fair comparison. This is statistical only. So because Dune also has a charge current interaction, it's a different channel from snow, but it's a charge current one. And how well that can do statistically is this vertical red band. So it's much thinner just because statistics is much huge. And in addition because every detector has electron, Dune also has this neutrino electron scattering, which measures a linear combination uh, of the different flux. And the intersection is this bright blue. And this just roughly illustrates that this Dune intersection is much smaller than the snow region. 
So from this, you sort of expect intuitively that it can improve on the angle measurement, just because you can figure out the ratio much better from a tighter intersection. And in addition, to improve on datum square, as I said, it's important to measure how things change as a function of neutrino energy, which means you want a tight relation between electron and neutrino energy. And this is, I don't know how to show this, but this is precisely what happens with this channel. Um, there's almost one to one relation between these two. Whereas before we're relying on neutrino electron scattering, and that has unfavorable kinematics. Okay, so this is just because of this, the presence of this channel, we expect Dune can improve on both the angle and delta square for the solar oscillation. So how we actually mock the analysis is uh, reasonably simple um, in that we just take 40 kiloton year exposure. Uh, keep in mind that Dune is supposed to be a 40 kiloton detector, so this will be roughly two, two more years, uh, <coughs> two, three years of running time. And the key point is you want to separate neutrino electron scattering and neutrino argon charge current because it's two detector channels. And luckily, there's a very easy way to do it. So suppose that's the sum. And so for electron scattering, mostly this electron is uh, forward. So it, it's mostly directly backwards away from the sum. Whereas the neutrino argon interaction, again, because of kinematics, the outgoing electron is roughly isotropic. So a super simple way to cut, to separate them is to define some sort of forward cone, like away from the sun. And you expect inside the cone, it's mostly neutrino electron scattering. And outside the cone, it's mostly the charge current interaction. And realistically, if you do this, of course, you would do something fancier, but we want to keep the analysis simple. So we cut it outside the cone and inside the cone. So outside the cone, you mostly have charge current interaction. So that is the oscillation signal channel. And of course, there's going to be some mix between these two channels. So this is the electron scattering channel. That's the background. That's one of the backgrounds. And of course, there's also like real backgrounds. I will talk about that later. So that's this dash line. And in addition, I did not say very early on in that I said there's different channels, uh, there are different fluxes of solar neutrinos. And this boron 8 is a very well-measured channel. That's the channel that's been dominating the oscillation sensitivity. Um, so that's this one. But remember, I circled a few different branches and say that those have not been branched. And one of them is this HAP, helium proton interaction, because the flux is just much smaller than boron 8. But it has a little bit higher endpoint. And similarly, idea, because the kinematic is favorable, you see this peak of HAP here. Um, which there's a bit of like, like a, about 100 events or so in this higher energy region. Um, and inside the forward cone, which for this analysis, sorry, this, was, this will be considered background. Um, okay, so inside the forward cone, as you expected, the electron scattering channel dominant, so that's the main signal for oscillation. And then with all the other channels, would, you would have some in there, so those are considered backgrounds. So then you do a joint fit. Um, which you can get in, oscill uh, in oscillation parameter. So this is what you get. So and again, the left is present, and the right is our projection. So if the difference between a dot m square is indeed due to some sort of new physics, because um, again, one is measuring os vacuum oscillation, the other is really measuring neutrino matter interaction. Um, so if it's due to some sort of exotic neutrino matter interaction, then you might expect the best fit point to stay here. In this case, the one, two, three sigma of Dune can get this size. And we also have a next generation reactor neutrino experiment coming online that's called Juno. And Juno is so precise, that's actually the three sigma contour for Juno. It's just amazing. Um, <laughs> and, and the difference, if it's real, can be tested at uh, above five sigma, whereas now it's like a barely two sigma. And in a, uh, uh, yeah. a very stupid question, maybe. Uh, if I look at that, that thing on the left, the big tubular blob, you said that's possible, that we think that's due to the day night effect. That's If I split effect. my samples into day and night and redo yeah. the analyses, do I get two best fits? Ah, great question. So actually, if you get, if you set your analysis into, say, day, then I think at two sigma level, you would pretty much not 
you would barely get any anything because to get that m square, you need some sort of energy dependence. And for boron eight, you're entirely ah okay. So there it will be dominated by the joint the, the joint analysis between what you measure in boron eight, the slow and super k, and the lower energy region where you measure uh, rexinol. So I'm not sure how that would look, but it's probably very bad. The point is, <laughs> sorry, no, no, the, the point is um, the boron-8 spectrum is rather flat. If you don't go for day-night, you have to measure the upterm, essentially. And we have not, we, we don't have a positive detection on the upturn. So essentially, so for super-K and the snow, the oscillation probability is cons entirely consistent with flat. That would give you, to first order, no sense data on that square. I, I could look at the flat region and just separate my sample into, I took this during the day and I took this at night. Yeah, so you know, if your probability is entirely flat. <laughs> oh, the, uh, so the, the shape, the spectrum shapes also favors the smaller delta m squared, both, right? The, but so if, if weekly, day-night right? adds a more, and spectrum shape also adds, and combined is, is, is the total contour. So. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, but, uh, everything is more like everything for the global solar is consistent with the low. There's no subset of the data that, that favors the higher delta. I think that's right. the reaction for the run. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that's that's that would be quite surprising for the Kamland Kamland measurement to be off. Yeah, no, we don't believe the reactors are off. But, uh, right, it's, it's just such a clean measurement. Right. Yeah. Um, I use this data to question the neutrino meta mass standard uh, interaction thing, yeah. which can be addition to the oscillation in the Earth. Yes, I did not have time to go into this, but of course there's plenty of very creative testing models or trying to use models to explain this discrepancy. The, probably the most popular one would be non-standard interaction because it's rather intuitive, but people have also tried, for example, stern neutrinos and et cetera. Yeah, um, we can talk about that later. Sorry to have interrupted you, but since this is up here, then we're asking, does Juno really do that well in sine squared theta? They, they don't have a near detector, right? So then it's really hard to, to get the <sighs> it's, it, to, right? it's rather crazy um, because, um, yeah, no, from, from what I can tell, it's really robust because they observe the whole, like, they observe the whole the one two sector like it just looks really huge on your spectrum uh, we actually test this and um, from all reasonable and then all their assumptions look fairly reasonable it just looks so maybe because they're so huge you have huge statistics that just clobbers it but i would think it's be systematics limited by the lack of near detector but, uh, right but like you know they they have a, a bunch right and i think and when we look at this analysis they did take into account like you know, like the overall normalization on C and D. It looks reasonable. I don't think it's like hugely, like insanely optimistic. Okay, yeah, but we still have the reactor anomaly, right? We don't even know the, sp the predicted, you know, Huber Muller versus uh, the <laughs> right? So the 5%, yes. so anyway, okay, sorry. I'll let you continue. Yes, sorry. yes, <laughs> yes. Actually, <laughs> 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 what is it, uh, the baseline of Juno? Uh, Oh, I should know that number. Um, it's long. It's okay. Okay. Don't quite remember now. Sorry. No, I mean that's why. No, I should I should know that number. So. Because of, the bit, because of their baseline, yes, they can observe the whole delta m square thing extremely well. I think that's, that's also that also helps control the, the sign uncertainty as well, yes. Okay, um, right, and if you, are, if you happen to be uh, into this, so as I said, that half flux has not been measured before, and, um, and this Dune can also make the first detection of half flux uh, with the uncertainty of about 10%. Now this is actually quite exciting because this is the, because this interaction, it's helium and proton, it happens in a different region of the sun. So there's a lot of interesting astrophysics that one can probe with the flux. So that's a side effect. Um, right, but the main story is the oscillation. Okay, so now that concludes what I think Dune can bring to the solar neutrino measurement. 
Now let's look at the other MEV astrophysical neutrinos source, uh, supernova. Okay, so first, uh, I, I guess I should give a standard overview, brief overview of what I think a supernova neutrino signal is, because I think um, it's just there's a lot of confusion going on generally. Um, so, okay, so here I show new E bar flux uh, as a function of post mass time. So, uh, very briefly speaking, what happens during core collapse is the star has a iron core and with lighter material on the outer side. So it's like an onion structured thing. And the iron core mass keeps increasing because you have uh, right outside the core and there's silicon that's burning and just accumulating iron. And when the mass of the core exceed, exceeds the effective Chandra syndrome mass, which is about 1.4 solar mass, it just starts to collapse under its own gravity. And while the core collapses, of course, the density of the core increases, and eventually it hits the nuclear density, and the, basically it just cannot be compressed any further. So that at this point, uh, a shock would, the shock would, would just go outward. Um, and right when it's com, com, uh, compressed to the maximum point, that's, that's really the beginning of the bounce. So a lot of in supernova figures, you see like the time, uh, the time axis is post bounce. So at the maximum, like the smallest size, that's the post bounce time of zero seconds. Then they start going upwards. And you know, the generic story that we hear is the shock has propagating outward, and, but it doesn't have enough energy to just directly go outwards and expel everything at least according to modern simulation. So what happens is it properly hours, but it loses energy. At some point, the energy is just lost. It just stalls at some point, at some radius. And then the so-called neutrino heating mechanism is that we believe neutrino from the center, <coughs> they're very hot, and they can propagate behind the shock and add energy to dump, add more energy to the shock. And then the shock get revived, and it just expelled the whole star. So roughly speaking, that's the story of how supernova explodes. And so I would say you can characterize the supernova signal to, to a few very distinct time scales in the following way. So before the iron core starts to collapse, really, so it's just a regular star. And there you get, because you know, there's nuclear fusion reactions and temperature is quite high, so there's thermal neutrino emission. And so you get some very little neutrino flux, actually just from, has nothing to do with any of the collapse physics. It's just regular silicon burning. And this is the so-called pre-supernova flux. And this has been, like, got some attention in the field in the, past, a couple, in the past few years because it has a really nice property in that the flux is very low, so we don't really expect to be able to detect it if we have a standard supernova at, you know, the middle of the Milky Way. But if the supernova is very close, we may possibly detect it. Then it's nice because you know supernova is happening. So you can see it coming. And this lasts about like a couple of days or a few hours or something like that time scale. So it's, it's a really cute story if we can use it to alert us that supernova burst is coming. But this, this, this physics-wise is distinct from really the collapse physics. And flux-wise is rather low. OK. Then when things, when things start to compress or going outwards, um, there you have some neutrino emission, and that's this, what's labeled the creation phase. And generally, this whole explosion happens somewhere between 0.2 to 1 second or so, let's say 1 second time scale. So in this case, uh, because of the simul how the simulation is treated, you see a kink here. That mark, in this model, the explosion happens at about uh, 200 milliseconds, 0.2 seconds. But generally, it happens anywhere between you know, up to a second or so. And then once the explosion happens, you expel the outer, outer stuff, you're left with a proto-neutron star. And that just cools by emitting neutrinos. So then after this kink, everything else is essentially some sort of cooling physics. Um, <coughs> Yeah, you can just imagine it's power producing neutrinos and then cools, the temperature drops. Eventually, the proton neutron star temperature will be low enough that the whole star is transparent to neutrinos. And that actually marks the birth of a neutron star. Of course, if the neutron star is the rough remnant. So here, that's illustrated here. You see a very sharp drop off in luminosity. And here, a neutron star is born. 
And I just to just orientate the time scale, this happens about t uh, 60 seconds or so in this particular model. And from a detection point of view, I would say you can probably think of it as the three time periods in that pre-supernova is it's quite its own thing. Um, and then we generally consider a neutrino signal to be a 10 second detection window. So here I mark zero to 10 seconds as the main signal. But just, a, just to highlight that in fact there's a lot of signal outside 10 seconds, say just for super K because modern detectors of course much larger. And we generally expect supernova to, the average expectation is middle of the Milky Way which will be closer to 87A for example. So event rate will be high. And I would say for like a super K kind of detector, you would imagine the detect late time is about mm, 10 seconds to a minute. Okay, so that is the general picture of what happens of a supernova and if we look at it from a new E bar perspective. Now, what does new E bring us? Well, I would say it definitely more than doubles the amount of information by combining with new E bar. And keep in mind that the new E bar is really the only channel we know for sure we can measure well. So the first thing that's probably is more what we know is the so-called neutronization burst. Again, this is time, this is also the post-bounce post -bounce time, really. Um, so have very, very quickly, at tens of millisecond time scale, um, really right before everything, right when everything start to happen, when the shock propagate, just start to propagate outwards. So this happens very, very fast while it propagating before it stalls. Um, it rapidly, so let's say, electron rapidly capture um, proton and make neutrinos and uh, neutrons. Because if you think about it, so what hap how do you turn a iron core into a neutron star? Well, you need to turn a lot of protons into neutrons. So turning protons into neutrons is really a key aspect of what's happening during a supernova. And that process pr uh, produce new E. So this happens very fast in the beginning and this is called neutronization burst. And it's generally, it's, it's very well appreciated and, you, and also this is a very robust signal if you look at all different simulation models and, and stuff because it's based on physics principle you know roughly how that it happens. And this signal can be detected, of course, very well in new, new E argon interaction, and that's what you see. And in comparison, if you only have electron scattering, again, without argon, that's what we will have. The signal rate is just much, much smaller, again, because of the large cross-section. And there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with this new transition burst. The first is that it's really like a timing beam, because it happens so fast, like on a scale of tens of milliseconds. And this is, a signal, this is a signal that you should expect to happen across all different kind of detectors with, some, with you know, probably higher, sense of higher detec detection significance in doom, but you would also expect to see it a little bit in other detectors too. So it's really a good clock that marks the beginning of a supernova, I would say, across all different detectors. So it's really nice. Another thing that's really fun about this new transition burst is that, so as I said, supernova neutrino oscillations really difficult, especially in early time. So if you can only detect one signal, one channel, it's always difficult to say how much is, what's the emission at the source and how much things have mixed with everything else. It's just very difficult to disentangle stuff. But in the early stage, you only have new E because this is before really anything else happened. So new E bar, new mu, new, new tau stuff is, is not really present. With only new E, it's very easy compared to other later time to know how things would oscillate. And that the oscillation probably changed, differ drastically, depends on whether you're in a normal hierarchy or inverted hierarchy. So you can hope to measure the strength of the signal and that may tell you something about the hierarchy of neutrinos, which will be really, really cool because this is something you infer in a 10 millisecond detection events, uh, detection window. Okay, so I would say using new E, using argon channel to measure neutron transition burst and do sort of physics is reasonably well appreciated in the field. Um, but I want to focus on, but I also want to highlight something else. So other than the initial burst, there's this long cooling period 
that really is dominating your signal from you know one second to one minute. So there's a lot of events there. And even there, um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of stuff you can do with measuring both new E and new E bar. So let's see what I mean. So here I plotted the neutrino luminosity as a function of post bounce time and of three different flavors. So new E, new E bar, and new X. So in supernova, new tau, new tau bar, new mu, new mu bar are the same. So everything is just labeled as new X. And there are a couple of things I want to show about this figure. The first is if we consider a very simple model, what's happening after one second, so after, during this entire cooling period, is very, very simple, actually. Um, basically, you have a constant luminosity. You have a luminosity that follows quite well as just 1 over t, because this is t multiplied luminosity. It's, it's rather flat for, you know, from one second to like 40 seconds or so. So it's just a 1 over t flux that's been dropping. And then at some point, you turn into a neutron star, and this is like really, really fast drop. OK, and, and basically the same story as a bit earlier that we roughly expect the six flavors to be about the same. So new me, uh, so all, you see that all the lines are basically on top of each other. The difference is mm, like 10% or so, so not significant. And I just wanted to highlight that if you, th if you think about the physics happening at about 10 seconds, it's no longer the standard core collapse, core collapse physics. You're really, it, it's like, you know, what happens at one second is like supernova. What happens at 60 seconds is neutron star. And the stuff happening in the middle is some, some sort of thing in between. So the kind of physics that's dominating the signal is more like neutron star physics as opposed to uh, core, collapse, uh, core collapse physics. And um, OK, so there is just to show that there's a lot of stuff between 1 and 100 seconds. Now, why is it interesting to measure three flavors? So here I show the average energy of the three different flavors. And you see that there's somewhat larger difference in the beginning. Uh, so average energy is about 10 to 14 MeV or so. And the difference is between 2 MeV, maybe 1 MeV in the beginning. And all the way down to, in the end, the average, the energy sort of converge. And the, the difference between UE and UE bar sort of just decreases to zero. The temperature difference here is extremely interesting. Um, because, as I said, just like the energy released during core collapse supernova is one key physics quantity that's dominating the process, the fact that protons are turning into neutrons is almost just as important. And the difference between how fast protons turn into neutrons, which is related to new E emission, and how much neutrons is turning into protons, of course, you know, there's some of this happening as well, related to new E bar uh, emission. And the rate difference, of course, is really crucial to determine how much final protons are turning into neutrons. So to measure this temperature difference really tells you, really gives you the physics about deleptonization. And that's, I would say, just as important as the total energy measurement. And that you have to figure out only by measuring UE and UE bar well and measure their temperature difference well. And another important thing is that we see, at, based on all you know, standard theory predictions, that the temperature difference should converge. And of course, this is something that we just have to test. Because if you consider, so generally we consider neutrino heating explosion mechanism. But it's possible that the explosion mechanism is something completely different. So some of those models would pr predict different, different uh, behavior between the new E and new E bar difference. So the fact that this, we want to measure what the difference is, that can inform us how much proton, how protons turn into neutrons. And we want to confirm that things eventually converge and that you're forming a neutron star. So I'm wondering what would happen if the explosion is not triggered. I mean, the shock that stalled, but the neutrino does not trigger, the, does not prevent the shock. And what would be the neutrino spectrum? And what, would be, what, would be, what would be the energy spectrum of the neutrinos in that case? Great question. And I don't have that in my backup, but I can show you afterwards. So roughly, if the shock is not revived, um, so you suppose here, instead of explosion, the shock just died, then you're forming a, new, a black hole. 
And when black hole forms, the luminosity drops to zero in zero time for all relevant time scale. So whenever a black hole forms, just wherever point you are on this curve, go straight down to zero. Um, and then, you know, so after that, it's just zero event. Um, generally, what happens is generally if you predict a black hole form, then before that, you're sort of still like, we're trying to explode exp uh, phase, where the temperature is typically rising. Uh, the average temperature is average energy is rising a little bit. So in luminosity, it will be some sort of increase in luminosity drops to zero. In the average temperature, it will be mild rise and then no signal. So that's black hole formation. So yes. why do we have the confusion if supernova explosion leads to black holes or neutron stars? Great question. And, um, and I, yeah, I also didn't include in the backup. Um, the quick answer is basically no. So um, as I said, because when black hole forms, even rate drops to zero in no time, so if this happens like early on, you're detecting like hundreds of events per second, and then sending zero. So you know for sure that a black hole forms, right? So the only possible confusion is that, you know, this thing is dropping, dropping, dropping. It probably looks like it's gonna form a neutron star. And that late times, you know, eventually here at 60 seconds or so, you're, you're just getting like the last event. Then if black hole forms like that late, you know, you're getting like three events in 10 seconds, and then you got zero events, so what's happening? So there you might get some sort of confusion. And black hole can indeed form at late times. So if I quote three sigma separation power as a, as a standard, you can basically tell it apart up to 40 seconds or so for this particular model. And if after 40 seconds, the, the regular nominal rate is low enough that you might get it confused. Does that make sense? Right, so early time, no. But if it's later, it's gonna form a neutron star, but it, due to some other reason, it decides to turn into a black hole. Then after 30, 40 seconds, you, you might not tell the part. Okay. Um, okay, so it looks like I'm gonna run over time. Um, so let me just jump to the last section. Seeing that, I think there's great potential if we can measure new E channel very well in argon. But I want to highlight that doing this measurement in Dune is very difficult, and there's a lot of effort that has to go in to make sure this happens. And I will talk about a couple of them. The first one is just trigger. So this is that Dune is a detector that's designed to work at GeV, to detect accelerator neutrino at GeV. A GeV event is you know, very big. Um, and distinct. So this is an event display from Microboom, uh, which is also using liquid argon time project, a TPC technology that Doom will use. So this is how, like, it's, how it's basically like 2D imaging or 3D imaging sort of detector. So for a neutrino event to come in, for example, here, you can see big charged particle tracks. So higher energy event is bigger tracks or more particles of final states. So that's a, like a, Imagine that's like a beam neutrino event that you're designed to aim for. Like a five MeV detect electron probably will show up like, like that, <coughs> something like that. If you can't see though, what I'm pointing at that's expected, it's, there's like two pixels of green dots here. And you know, for like, especially like a supernova, a solar neutrino at fi about five, more, five MeV or so electron energy, you will be fishing out those little dots out in the environment where you have a lot of these kind of events. So how to do this, of course, is very difficult. And that's uh, under study. And the next thing that I want to say is that this background line. So when I show the solar neutrino event, I have one line that's called background. And here is where they are. So it's, it's three, th three components, with one being a really big problem. So I'll explain what they are. So doing the sitting under mine, in the mine, underground, and there's rock nearby. The rock has uranium and thorium in them. Uranium and thorium would alpha decay give, give alpha in a rock. And these alphas can interact with like silicon uh, or something else in the rock. And then it can kick out some sort of MeV neutrons. And this just happens all over in surrounding rock. And these MeV neutrons 
can just go into your detector. Because you might know that generally we shield neutrons with some sort of thing that has hydrogen, so either water or plastic or something. But DUNE, because, again, because it's designed to work as a GEV machine, it does not really have significant shielding outside. So then it just comes into argon. And then argon is also particularly bad when it comes to neutron self-shielding. So it doesn't really confine these events to like edges. They just come in like the whole argon, like the whole detector, which is really big, and it will, will just be filled with neutron capture. And this weight is huge. So without any kind of shielding, we expect neutron capture to happen at a rate of like 100 hertz in a detector. With, you know, we're trying to do like MEV solar neutrino detection. So it's, it's just really, really large. And the neutron capture gives you a gamma ray like about here, and then you smear it uh, with whatever energy resolution you can get. And that's, this, is the, this is the tail of the smeared line. And to make this plot where the signal curve looks about this high, we actually assumed 40 centimeter of shielding which cuts the background rate down by about a factor of, I think, ten, somewhere between 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 4. So if you don't shield it, which is the current design, this curve will be about fact, like a thousand or a few thousand times higher on this curve with a signal rate about here. So, and this is how it compares to solar signal. And, and, but it would also be a problem for supernova signal because you want to detect supernova signal all the way to last few events, because with the next, next galactic core collapse, we can actually do that. So eventually, you're bound to run into a region where you're detecting like two or three events every couple of seconds or so. And then if you have a, like 100 hertz background, like an MEV thing hanging around, that will be a big problem. OK, so and I think I'm running out of time. So if you want to talk about cross-section uncertainty, I'm all for it. And the summary is that this channel has great physics promise. It's really, really amazing in that we will not get 40 kiloton of liquid argon or any other better nucleus for MEV neutrino astrophysics. But this channel is difficult. There's trigger problem, there's background problem, there's cross-section problem, there's data readout problem, and I'm happy to talk about all of that. So a lot of hard work is needed. And that brings me to my conclusion. I think there is a lot of open, extremely interesting open problems in solar neutrinos and supernova neutrinos. Despite that, solar neutrino might seem like a mature field, and supernova neutrinos seem to be completely wide open. And Dune is really a great opportunity for this field as a whole. And the physics promise is great, but we need to do a lot of hard work and get ready. So thank you. I mean, the backgrounds always go like, yeah, like this background, for example. This is the, the, the tip here is a cosmogenic, the regular cosmogenic background. It actually keeps going up to higher energy. And, and also for cosmogenic, this is actually after what we, what we, the cut that we came up with. So like before cut is probably like a factor of 10 higher, but we think that's reasonably under control. So there's always stuff like, there's, there's definitely cosmogenic that you need to cut. Um, but we don't consider, we, uh, to the best of our ability, we did not find any background that's comparable to HEP after standard, standard treatment. So the difficulty in, like, for example, super K really is because, because really of the kinematics of neutrino electron scattering. So it's, it's effectively just smearing things a lot more. So then there, what happens, the burn aid get really smeared. It just rolled over, cover up your HEP. But other backgrounds, we think it's fine. So you're really optimistic in being able to measure very well? Or For HEP, um, yes, because, um, yes. So 100 events per two, three years? Uh, so this is 100 kiloton year exposure. 
Yeah, so um, so for full 40 kiloton, yeah, it will be like 2.5 years. Like people say that maybe two of the modules will go in first, so that will be 20 kiloton, 20 kiloton at first. In that case, it will be like five years. Okay, and just a question about the background. Uh, so you said that the neutrons come in from the outside. How yeah. far into the detector they come, or does it matter? Uh, so, so right, so that's I was saying. So, uh, because Argon doesn't doesn't stop these neutrons, they pretty much fill up the whole detector. Yeah. Like the detectors, the mo large volume come from the length, like it's like sixty meters long. That does not help you because you know there's rock surrounding the whole six meter, and it's like ten meters or something like one direction. And yeah, you can go up to you you can easily go to five meters. So yeah. it looks uniform. That's unfortunate. So what would be the constraint about, what would make the decision between shielding and no shielding in the end? Is it cost? Is it a space in the cavern issue? Or is it? Um, so initially with, yeah, so initially, yes, initially we thought it was going to be cost, which didn't seem so horrible. I mean, it is a lot more expensive than probably because the detector is really, really big. To cover it up, you know, you still need probably like a couple millions of material. Right, which is nothing for you, I assume. Right, but, um, <laughs> but the practical problem that we run to do is, is really the, the space, because like the detector apparently just fits into the cavern like rather tightly. So it's not like you have a whole lot of space to do stuff. So, so it turned out the detector size has some sort of depth. So like we look into how to put stuff in like in holes. So it's 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 just the cavern is tight. Mm 